Chairman Raskin, Ranking Member Mace, Chairwoman Maloney, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Alejandra Caraballo, and I am a clinical instructor at Harvard Law School's Cyber Law Clinic and LGBTQ rights advocate. I have worked in LGBTQ rights advocacy for years as a civil rights attorney, and I have monitored anti-LGBTQ extremist content online as part of my advocacy work. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you in my personal capacity to discuss the pressing issues of rising white supremacy in the context of anti-LGBTQ hate and the ways that social media have amplified this issue and made it worse. In the balance of my testimony, I will seek to document in more detail the nexus between white supremacy and the recent rise in extreme threats against the LGBTQ community. Additionally, I will provide some recommendations for how Congress could better hold social media companies accountable for their role in amplifying this rise in extremism, while also aiding law enforcement and civic society groups in limiting extremist conduct that endangers and harms vulnerable, marginalized groups. We only need to look at recent events to gain an understanding of the extent of the problem. At the beginning of this month, on the weekend of December 2nd, several extremist groups targeted the LGBTQ community. This wave of bigoted action was caused by the Proud Boys, the anti-Semitic Goyam Defense League, Patriot Front, and other white supremacist groups. This weekend of hate comes just weeks after five people were murdered and at least 19 people were injured in a shooting at Club Q, an LGBTQ club in Colorado Springs. At the start of the week, the Department of Homeland Security Bulletin warned of broad threats against LGBTQ Jewish and immigrant communities. The weekend itself began with the arrest of a Texas man for making death threats against a Boston physician who provides gender-affirming care to transgender patients. This doctor was affiliated with the National LGBTQ Health Center at Fenway Health, an organization of which I am proud to serve as a board member. In Columbus, Ohio, armed militia members, Proud Boys and Patriot Front showed up to forcibly shut down a holiday-themed drag event at the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Columbus. In Lakeland, Florida, the neo-Nazi group Natsoc Florida carried swastika flags and banners that called drag queens, quote, pedophiles with AIDS. They also used a projector to place text on the building called for the death of pedophiles, clearly meaning that drag queens when read in context with their banner. In New York, a drag event at Lincoln Center was targeted by members of the Goyam Defense League, a bigoted neo-Nazi org that promotes virulent anti-Semitism. Finally, a drag event in Southern Pines, North Carolina, was subjected to weeks of threats after a tweet by Libs of TikTok highlighted it. The event itself went on despite the threats against organizers and the presence of several Proud Boys outside. However, it was disrupted by power loss due to intentional sabotage at a power station nearby. While there is no confirmed link between the threats against the uh, LGBTQ community event and the attack on the power substation, the timing has put the local LGBTQ community on edge. The events in Ohio, North Carolina, Florida, and New York feature well-worn basis accusations of grooming and so-called child abuse. They underscore the ongoing amplified threat to an LGBTQ community already reeling from deadly violence. This has been a long, winding road of escalating rhetoric and tactics that were first popularized on social media and spread to the physical world. Prominent social media accounts often perpetuate incendiary language that manifests into real-world violence. There is a direct connection between these accounts and violent threats against people, events, and institutions they target. The framing and language used often mirrors a more accessible version found on extremist sites, such as 4chan. Their audience of millions are eager to engage with replies of the tweets of these accounts featuring threats, including violent memes of bullets and wood chippers. Social media companies have failed to intervene in meaningful ways, allowing the active spread of hate speech through algorithmic amplification and the monetization of this hate content. Lastly, I want to highlight the great personal cost of being a highly visible trans woman in this atmosphere. Earlier this year, I, along with my parents, were doxxed and had our personal information published, including my home address, personal contact information, social security number, and, a driver, and my driver's license number. I have been basically called a groomer and a pedophile on social media more times than I can count solely because I am a queer and trans person. This is particularly and deeply offensive as I have spent, I spent three years as an attorney representing the survivors of sex trafficking and intimate partner violence. These spurious accusations hurt real victims of sexual abuse by depriving the language they use to describe what happened to them. 
I have been threatened by anonymous online accounts that have stated they wanted to tie me to an effing post and set me on fire. Others have targeted me with violent imagery of trans people being hanged. I have received physical letters that have glorified genocide and openly fantasized about being able to legally murder people like me. In September, I met with the FBI regarding these threats against me, an utterly surreal experience. No one should go through this solely for being who they are and defending their community. However, I will not be intimidated and I will not be silenced in spite of the constant harassment and threats I receive. I will continue to speak out against the hate and violence being perpetrated against my community and LGBTQ, Jewish, immigrant, and uh, Muslim siblings. I thank you for the opportunity to testify here today on these issues and I look forward to answering your questions.